I think we're going to have a lot to discuss, um, but before we do that, um, our third and final speaker I have has always been, I think, a very busy person, and I think as um, Eduardo Mondlane Jr. said this morning, she has always also been not merely a busy person, but a very active player. Um, she was very active in the early days of the liberation struggle, and after independence, um, went to live in Maputo, um, and she's been an active player in a range of different activities there since, and most recently has founded the Eduardo Shivambo Mondlane Foundation, um, and she is going to talk to us about that, and I think her notion of hopes for a better future of, for the people of Mozambique. So, Janet. Thank you very much, Sonia. And of course, it's with great pleasure that our family accepted the invitation to come to Oberlin in this celebration of life. This is certainly one of Eduardo's fam uh, favorite places, and if he had lived, he certainly would have been a frequent visitor to this college. And then maybe when the liberation struggle was over and maybe some affairs of states, maybe he would have come here as a guest professor. He would like to have been very much with us today here. I must say that some time ago, Al McQueen suggested a topic for me to speak on in this panel, and I had agreed to it. But as we were flying over, well, as we were flying from Maputo to New York, we passed through a terrible thunderstorm. And I made a kind of a one-sided agreement, agreement with God that if we survived, <laughs> I was going to talk about something a little bit different so that for sure next time the people here in this conference would know about what we hope for the future of Mozambique. So in honor of the last part of the, the topic I was given to talk about, which is dire poverty in Mozambique, um, which I was waiting for figures from John and from Ned to tell you so you know what is our point of departure. I'm just going to give you a few basic figures about what's happening in Mozambique today. So you, I'll just go very slowly so you can get the idea. Try to take yourself out of this room and put yourself in a country like Mozambique where the life expectancy is 47 years old. A lot of people in this room, including myself, would be long gone in living in a country like Mozambique. The infant mortality of under ones is 158 per 1,000 live births. And under five mortality is 275 per 1,000 live births. The GNP per capita, as I think John talked about, has risen to $150 um, per year. The question is, where did that rise go to which perhaps Ned talked about a bit. Percentage of adult literacy is 58% for males and 23% for females. UNESCO's Human Development Index places Mozambique ninth from the bottom in a list of 174 countries. So now we're in Mozambique and we can talk a little bit about what we hope for that country. <laughs> Under the tutelage of George Simpson and Milton Yinger here in Oberlin College, Eduardo wrote a paper for social movements. And in that paper, he stressed the importance of the role of the leader in any social movement. Very unfortunately, I only have a page and a half of that paper. 
However, that one thought comes through, the importance of the leadership in the social movement. When Eduardo became leader of the liberation struggle, which then later on became a guerrilla freedom fighter movement called Frenimo, Eduardo's friends in the state smiled at the improbable uh, idea of Eduardo in his business suit and his bow tie, the prototype academician as leader of a liberation struggle. But before he was killed, he had built the most successful freedom fighter movement in Africa. People often ask me, what was he really like? Even if we take the chinks into consideration, we can say that Eduardo was a warm and vibrant person tackling the problems of life with a zest. He loved his family and his people. His booming laughter hugged everybody to him, and his frown forced his friends and colleagues to think twice. He lived energetically in the present, but dedicated his life to the future. One of my very favorite images of Eduardo is of the very first time I saw him, the very first time, sounds like Roberta Fleck, a little before he entered Oberlin's front door as an undergraduate. He was speaking to a group of teenagers, a man full of enthusiasm for his subject, making an impromptu speech on the life of Mozambican youth, what they thought and felt, rocking on his toes and rubbing his already receding hairline. He never used the word freedom, for he had just come from his stay in Salazar's Portugal, and it would take him a while to liberate his tongue. But the need for freedom sang in every idea and danced to the rhythm of his descriptions of his people, the people that he loved and the nation that he cherished. The concern he projects is the need for his people to enter the contemporary scene, to keep the best of the traditional culture, but to slough off that which would forever diminish his people's stature on the stage of the modern world. That picture is from the summer of 1951. 17 years later, a seasoned politician on the world scene and an experienced leader of men, the essence of those thoughts were still there, as well as his concern for the creation of a successful democracy. He wrote, our problems will not end with independence. Winning independence in itself will not change the attitude, attitudes of people from one moment to the next. The colonial government principally repressed all those qualities that should have contributed to the success of democracy. Among the non-educated, the authoritarian rule discouraged the spirit of initiative, the sense of personal responsibility and instead provoked an attitude of non-cooperation with the government. Among the educated few, it promoted an elitist spirit, a characteristic of the complex, complex hierarchy of colonial government. It is this type of influence that we have tried to combat in the liberated zones of Mozambique, at the same, at the same time campaigning against problems brought about by traditionalism, such as tribalism, superstition, and the low level of political and economic knowledge. So the basic answer to the question, what was Eduardo really like, is that he was able to play many roles and make many different kinds of people understand the ideas he felt were essential for perceiving Mozambique as he himself saw his country. I have no doubt that if Eduardo needed to define himself <clears throat> near the end of his life, it would have been as a politician. He saw a politician as an academician turned active, an analyst and a human being. I personally think he was describing himself more than he was describing a, a defining a politician. But we must remember that it was in that spirit that he worked because, in truth, he could not have lived in any other way. Eduardo was always the teacher. 
He wrote the book, The Struggle for Mozambique, in order to teach those outside the liberation struggle something about what was happening in his small part of the world. He knew that what was going on was more than a national struggle. It was one which would affect Southern Africa and the continent as a whole. In a published paper, he wrote in a published paper more than a decade before, he had outlined his ideas on a federated Africa. Though he finally concentrated his energies on Mozambique, his thinking had leapt ahead to the interdependence of nations and the new international, social, economic, and cultural order before those concepts had become a conceptual reality. In all that we have heard today from John, from, from Ned, one thing is very, very clear. It is not easy to govern. Although Eduardo left us too early, he left a legacy for Mozambicans to build on, a legacy to help search for the vision he saw for his country. At home in Mozambique, we have established the Eduardo Chivambo Mondlan Foundation, whose major task is to build a vision for Mozambicans about who they are and what their country can become. Mozambique is not different from many other societies over the world where there are deep divisions because of race, region, religion, ethnic group, as well as social agglomerations like labor unions and associations for the support of various causes. There is not a consensus about how the larger society should operate. These groups hardly know how they fit into the greater picture. Some wondering if they even have a place at all. At this moment in our country, power is defined essentially with access to wealth, and the scramble for wealth is paramount. For democracy to flower, social healing and the politics of reconciliation are absolutely essential. There are ethical problems that distress our society, along with an almost total lack of community, moral code, and civic responsibility. Now, at this point in the paper that I wrote, there is a big hole. And the only thing I've written in here is make a transition. <laughs> so I'm go <laughs> I didn't have any time to make a written transition, so I'm just going to tell you about what I was going to put in as a transition. So what I, can s what I think is that I think probably all of us at last night, we were at the the speech made by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And he said that people who are really hungry and really poor don't have much time to think about ethics. Before I came here to Oberlin, I was at Connecticut College where I gave a lecture on the development of democracy in Mozambique. And a professor said, he was the head of the African Studies program there, and he said, democracy really doesn't matter because it's, if a country is suffering economically, there's really not room to think and not time to think about developing democracy. Having lived in the, passed through the armed struggle and lived through and participated in the centralist government, which really didn't have much time to listen to popular opinion. And then after that, the terrible civil war. And then the painful structural adjustment that we passed through. I really have, would be inclined to agree. However, on thinking about that, after this professor at Connecticut College said this, there's not time for democracy. I thought about it a lot. And I didn't really have a good 
answer for him right off the cuff because I never do. But then afterwards, I was thinking about it and I thought, if our leadership on independence had, from the first instance, educated our people for democratic participation in society, perhaps perhaps some of those awful events that took place in Mozambique, they may have happened, but at least maybe they would have been modified. One could write a very long paper about that. And I hope my daughter, who's going to come to Oberlin College, I hope, is going to think about these things as she has time to ponder what has happened in Mozambique. But we are in a new phase now, and I think the time is ripe, and I think the tide has come in, and I think it's time to grab the chicken or incubate the egg or whatever and get on with it. A nation is made up of people. That is the very essential factor we must remember. The nation is made up of people. It is not just the people we read about in the newspaper, the Shisanos, the Pascual Macumbis, the Leonardo Simão. Behind those, or somewhere, I wouldn't say behind in the sense of support, but there is a mass of 17 and a half million people. So what is it that we're trying to do in the Eduardo Mondlan Foundation? In the first place, we want to try to provoke very open public debate about the big issues that fa face Mozambique today. For people who live in the, in the United States, that doesn't seem like a very important, I mean, it's not a really big problem. But it has been a big problem in Mozambique. It has been a very big problem in Mozambique to have public discussion. Secondly, the Mondlan Foundation will involve itself in research social science research. And this research will take place in trying to discover historically and today, sociologically and anthropologically, who are the Mozambican people? Who are we? How can we understand ourselves? Because of course first, if a nation needs, wants to grow and govern itself, it has to know who we are. We must know who we are, and we don't really know who we are. And lastly, among the very major activities, is the quest for social stability through conflict resolution. The foundation is going to sponsor meetings of every sort, inviting informed people internationally to join with concerned Mozambicans to help look for ways to overcome problems affecting thought-provoking research into previously untouched areas whose content influences decision and decision makers. Besides the research necessary for the above meeting, scientific research in the social science is vital to the rational growth of a healthy, informed society. The foundation's link with the Eduardo Mondlan University will support this vital facet of intellectual activity through the active support of scholars interested in social research. Publications in print and in, in, print and in the electronic media will be the natural resort of, result of these meetings and research. The conflict resolution component in the foundation looks at political and governance issues, socioeconomic issues, community or grassroots issues, and academic and policy-oriented research. This activity aims at helping to promote a peaceful equilibrium which is still lacking in our country. In brief, the activities of the foundation cover the areas of education, culture, and peace. Um, sometime along here, Al McQueen is going to give each one of you, or some of you, a folder which talks about the background of the foundation and this very pretty map I made which shows our activities during 1999 and the year 2000. One could say, oh, this is a very normal kind of foundation. 
this is a foundation which is existing, can exist anywhere in the world. But in the last couple of weeks, we have found that in Mozambique, this foundation and its activities are very innovative. When we started the foundation, when the whole, this was 1996, when we started the foundation, those who govern us were very enthusiastic about it. I think they hadn't read the document very well. And then we had a lot of support. There were great promises made, and we were going to really go on with the foundation with the blessing of the Free Limo Party and with all the powers that be. Just a few days before I came here, I was having a, actually I was called to the president's office and he said, you know, I'm sorry to say, but those kinds of uh, amenities that we were going to extend to you, we're not going to be able to do because Frilimo has decided to f establish our own foundation because we see that your foundation is not precisely what we had in mind. That's why my younger daughter, Nyeleti, is not here because she has had to stay at home and see what kind of organization she can put together again. However, like Eduardo did, we're forever optimistic and we know that the foundation will go ahead with the help of the 17 million Mozambicans and the other people in the rest of the world that believed in the things Eduardo believed in. So I think, from my point of view, Eduardo was really the personification of an African insight into a problem of the day, a people still struggling for freedom. Using his perceptions and his legacy, perhaps we can gain some insight into solving some of the puzzle that Mozambique remains. And in the song, in the rhyme of his life, we might discover the road to a calm and contented society. And thank you very much. <laughs>